Welcome and thank you for standing by. Today's conference will now begin. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session. At that time, if you would like to ask a question, you would press star 1 and record your first and last name. If you need to withdraw your question, you would press star 2. Today's call is being recorded. If there are any objections, you may disconnect. I will now turn the call over to Bettina and Klain. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Thank you, Operator. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is Bettina Klan, NASA Associate Administrator for Communications. Thank you for your patience. We had some little technical difficulties. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining the call this afternoon for an updated status on the Boeing uncrewed orbital flight test following yesterday's successful launch of the CST-100 Starliner at 6.36 a.m. on the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. The spacecraft is in a stable orbit on mission day two. Starliner is in good health and we will be able to meet several mission objectives for the flight test. Teams from NASA, Boeing, and the U.S. Army have been preparing for a landing tomorrow morning at White Sands in New Mexico, and NASA will cover, um, carry the, the coverage live on the landing beginning at 6.45 a.m. Eastern. For more on the current Day 2 mission status and landing, I'm joined by Jim Bridenstine, NASA Administrator, Jim Chilton, Boeing Senior Vice President, Space and Launch Division, and Steve Stitch, Deputy Manager, NASA Commercial Crew Program. We'll start with updates from each of them, and then we'll take questions from the media um, on, that are participating on the call. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to NASA Administrator, Jim Bridenstine. Well, thank you, Bettina, and uh, I appreciate everybody continuing to follow the Starliner mission. Um, as Bettina said, we do have a healthy spacecraft. Um, the NASA team and the Boeing team um, have been working hand in glove um, to accomplish as many of the test objectives as we can accomplish ahead of tomorrow's entry, descent, and landing. And um, I think there's some really good milestones that we have been able to achieve um, we want to make sure that we are continuing as much as possible our um, our effort to be transparent, to share information as early as possible when we have it, uh, but we also want to be accurate when we share information. So um, there's still a lot that we need to learn, a lot of data that we need to collect, and we'll be sharing that um, once once we once we get um, all the information we need to be accurate. Um, but certainly, we're, we're thrilled that people are on the line, and we want to answer questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim Chilton with Boeing. Thank you, Administrator Bridenstine, and I'll echo the thanks to everybody for their interest in our in our flight test. Let, let me start by saying that one of the biggest things we've learned is how good this team is. The the Boeing NASA team on our very first flight got a little surprise immediately upon reaching space and their reaction and professionalism has been really inspiring and, and what it inspires is confidence for future missions. This is, this is quite a team. I'll give you a quick status. Uh, we're in a circular orbit now, 250 by 250 kilometers. That's lower than we expected to be, but fine, and we chose that because it gives you the most uh, chances to come home while continuing to run tests. The vehicle status is really excellent. All our avionics systems are good, our life support systems, in the cabin, all look great. Thermal management, power is neutral or better, meaning we're you know we're able to orient the spacecraft. We have full attitude control and can move it around. Uh, we have all the instruments working. In fact, we're able, as a matter of learning, remember this is a flight test. We're able to now start changing the red lines, and you know we start real tight, and we can move those around a little bit, and we're doing that and making sure we learn as much as we can before the next flight. So that's very encouraging. And regarding data, we are just going to get an enormous amount of data. We're getting it now. We've established link with the space station, which is super important because we want the station to be able to take the vehicle when necessary. And we've also got uh, Rosie the Rocketeer in the vehicle and an anthropometric test dummy. And we have boxes in the vehicle that when we get when she returns, another large pile of data about what happened in the cabin, what happened on the hull thermally, what happened structurally. So we're, we're real excited to collect, already collect an enormous amount of information. So real happy there. Uh, I'll, let, me, let me kind of pivot on to objectives of the flight test. You know, from a, from a flight test standpoint, it's a brand new human space system. The most difficult things we do 
or the launch. You know, you've got you've got to get to space safely, and then we've got to enter, descend, and land safely. So we're real happy with the Atlas V human-rated performance. You know, it had a different aero shape. That all worked fantastic. Emergency detection system was active, but uh, I shouldn't say active, was on, but not active to override anything. So the engineers all got a great chance to see that data. Uh, we in space, we've already been ticking off some objectives. I'll talk about a couple. One is the link with the space station. That's real important because in the future, as we approach the station, we want the station crews to be able to stop the vehicle if they choose to or, or push it back or maybe bring it in. So that's, that was great to see that link because we're, we're not in the position we expected to be in, so it's sort of a stress test. All our uh, guidance is working. I'll, I'll give you an example. Our, our vision system, which we use to dock, is our, our term is VESTA. It's an acronym. I won't, I won't bore you with it, but it has four sensors, and it, it, it's like our eyes. So once we get the space, VESTA can be like a sextant from the celestial navigators, the sailors of old, and we've proven that VESTA can look at the stars, she can tell you right where the spacecraft is and feed the inertial and GPS-based navigation devices. So the spacecraft can figure out where it is and orient itself quite fine. We've checked off those test objectives. And we've also extended and retracted the docking system, the, the mechanical ways you would go get yourself attached to the station. We've, we've uh, mechanized that, and we, we know that'll work. And that was a good thing to get done and make sure next time we fly and approach the space station that we know that we won't get any surprises there. There's a longer list, but I, I would summarize our objective performance by uh, not all objectives are created equal. You know, I started by saying the launch and the entry, descent, and landing are really big safety issues. So we've got the first of the big ones, and we've got a great proportion of the uh, objectives for in space. Now, I'll, I'll temper my comments a little bit. The, the Entry, descent, and landing is not for the faint of heart, and this vehicle has not entered. We have not gone from space to the atmosphere. We have tested all the functions that you need after you get into the atmosphere during our pad abort test, but you know, don't make no mistake, we still have something to prove here on entry tomorrow. And again, we think our team has done a, a fantastic job being ready for that. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to address a few things, maybe get ahead of questions. Uh, one is yesterday in my remarks I talked about the orbital insertion burn and I was I didn't I, I told you what I did know but didn't have a complete understanding. Our best understanding 24 hours later now is uh, or maybe maybe more is our spacecraft needs to reach down into the Atlas V and figure out what time it is where where is the Atlas V in its mission profile and then we set the clock based on that. Somehow we reached in there and grabbed the wrong spot. I don't. This, this doesn't look like an atlas problem. This looks like a, we reached in and grabbed the wrong coefficient. More to learn there, but that's, it's not more complicated than that. And we started the clock at the wrong time. As a result of starting the clock at the wrong time, the, the spacecraft, upon reaching space, thought she was in a different, she thought, she thought she was later in the mission, and being autonomous, started to behave that way. Uh, and, and so it wasn't, put in, wasn't in the orbit we expected without the burn, and it wasn't in the attitude expected and was in fact adjusting that attitude and so when you talk about I, yesterday I talked about the delay we had in some minutes of of linking to the tracking data relay satellites TDRS we think that combination of getting between a couple satellites but more so we were moving the vehicle and not in the attitude to get an easy link so we think that contributed to the delay again a little more work to do but we know more today and so that is an unexplained and understood thing, not something we want to do again, but we designed the system to be able to hold on to Tetris all the time, and now we, we think we know why she didn't. We do have, uh, as, as a result of going into that position in space, the spacecraft needed to work pretty hard to hold attitude. We talked yesterday a little bit about uh, how the dead bands, you come down around the sensors and controls itself much more finely. That means we gave the propulsion system on the service module quite a workout and and we have a lot of duty cycles on it it's you know on the on from the good side it's a great test of the durability of the service module so we put a lot of dirty duty cycles on it in an uncrewed test that's that's a good thing uh, wasn't part of the plan but it, but it turns out being a good thing on the negative side it gives the engineering team a lot to go look at before we choose entry to declare for entry that's been done we've looked at the behavior of the sensors and I would 
Then I would characterize our choices on the prop system. We have a lot of redundancy, so anywhere there was a question or one of the sensors was telling us they were either hot or unhappy, we just shut those down, and then we have incrementally reactivated them. And things look real good. It looks like we might have a couple sensor problems, but we have no thruster or propulsion problems. Although it's fair to say the team had to do a lot of work to prove that because we chose to we chose to assume we had bad hardware until we could prove otherwise. And and the excellent job by the technical team and flight ops team proven otherwise. So with that, I'll say we're, the state of our propulsion system as we ready ourselves for entry tomorrow is. Uh, and I'll give you a little detail. There are, there are separate propulsion systems on the crew module and the service module. The service module will position us for entry. And then the service module is discarded and goes into the ocean. These challenges I've talked about are all on the service module. The crew module propulsion system, which then will be active after the service module goes and take care of us during reentry, we've had no duty cycles on that. It'll get a short test some hours before we declare for reentry and activate the service module functionality. So we, we don't see any problem so long as we remain happy like we are with the service module. So kind of in closing, we have more to prove. We've got to prove this spacecraft will enter and be a, be a healthy system. But in the launch worked great. We had a we had a unexpected event and our team reacted fantastic. I look forward to Steve Stitch's remarks on that. In space, Starliner has proven to be an you know an able vessel. She is performing great, and we are looking forward to getting her home and getting all that data and saying hello to Rosie. Okay, hey, th thanks, Jim. Uh, I would say the teamwork, as Jim's already alluded to, between the Boeing and NASA team, it was phenomenal all the way up through the launch preparations over the last couple of months, working side by side our Boeing engineers and NASA engineers, and I would echo Jim's comments that during the flight, uh, this fairly stressful uh, timing issue has caused us to work more closely together than ever over the last 24 hours, and we'll continue to do so as we prepare for deorbit and entry. Uh, the engineering teams are working side by side, uh, evaluating the data, evaluating the spacecraft, and, and that has been one thing that is extremely positive about the whole uh, this, this whole OFT mission. Um, as Jim said yesterday, the team optimized the orbit and, and did two uh, two burns with uh, orbital maneuvering uh, thrusters, and got us into this uh, approximately 250 kilometer circular orbit. Those two burns give us a lot of confidence as we come up for entry. We'll use a lot of the same systems for the for the deorbit burn. Uh, to start uh, in, re-entering into the atmosphere, so we'll use the, the RCS thrusters and the orbital maneuvering thrusters for the deorbit burn, and those two burns give us a lot of confidence uh, for that for those, that deorbit burn coming up. Um, as Jim also said, the spacecraft from a NASA perspective is working really well. You know, except for this uh, this timing issue, which was corrected once we got on orbit, the time is working fantastic for the rest of the mission. All the burns are happening as they should. We're acquiring uh, sensors as we should. We're having teeters communications as we should. Uh, all the vehicle events are happening just the way they, they should. Um, the interior of the cabin temperature has been perfect for the crew the whole time. The cooling system on the vehicle is working well. The propulsion system's working well. The guidance navigation and control. Um, all those systems that we need for, for a crewed mission are working as expected. So we're getting a lot of really good data as we fly the vehicle on orbit. Um, the power margins are good. We we're pointing at the sun with the solar rays and charging those batteries. Uh, that's actually been a little bit better than expected. Even though we used a little extra prop uh, after launch with the timing error, we have really good prop margins heading into the, the deorbit burn and entry for the, both the service module and the crew module. Um, we're setting up for uh, an entry tomorrow. The the uh, deorbit burn for White Sands on Orbit 33 is at 6:23 a.m. That's Central Time, and landing should occur at uh, 6:57 there at the White Sands Space Harbor. Uh, the Boeing teams or the NASA teams are out at the site, getting the site ready and prepared for that landing. Uh, and in between now and landing, we're doing the final checks of all the systems on the spacecraft and also ensuring that the guidance navigation control will work as expected, not only for that deorbit burn for entry, 
uh, over the next uh, 16 to 18 hours. Uh, I would say um, so far it's been a great mission, and as Jim said, the, the part that's ahead of us, if you break up space flight into the, the, the chunks, the asset part um, with launch went very well, both from a Starliner and um, the Atlas launch vehicle perspective, and now we're going to embark upon a really tough and challenging phase, executing the deorbit burn, having the, dis the service module do its disposal burn and entering into the water, and then having the crew module execute the entry, uh, firing its thrusters, and uh, then going through the parachute deploy sequence uh, and landing at the White Sands Space Harbor. So it's a it's a, a system that we have to test. The only way to test it really is to do an entry, and we have that in front of us. We're being very diligent as we plan for that entry. So I think I'll stop now and uh, see if there's any questions. We will now begin our question and answer session. If there are any questions, please press star 1 and record your first and last name. One moment for our first question. Like the operator just said, we now will take questions from the media. Please remember to state your name, affiliation, and whom you're directing your question. We request one question per person to make sure we get as many people as possible. Um, our first question is from Chris Davenport, Washington Post. for um, taking my question. Um, I know you kind of touched on it, uh, but I was wondering, you know, what your concerns are, what your confidence level is uh, about pulling off the landing su successfully, um, also especially after, you know, there was the one pin on the uh, pad abort uh, on the parachute systems. And also I wonder if you could give us some, you know, details on the landing itself, the trajectory that'll, that it will be taking, where it'll fly over, uh, its um, maximum velocity and uh, the temperature too that it'll have that the we that the heat shield will have to uh, withstand. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. This is Jim Chilton. I'll I'll start with the uh, the parachute. Uh, you're referring to for for everybody listening. We're referring to during our pad abort test. We had a intended to have three shoots, and, and it was in New Mexico first week of November. The the Toughest design case for us is low atmosphere to get the capsule off a off a vehicle. So we ran it as if it was sitting on the pad. That what what happens is you fire the pusher abort system on the bottom of the service module and you go you know, you go from the ground at the speed of sound pretty high in about five seconds, and then you go through your descent and pop the chutes. We had a misrig, which means a pin that holds some of the rigging for a for a pilot chute that pulls out the mains. The pin. The operators who assembled that thing, it appeared the pin was in, but the, our design allows that to be misread. And, and so, of course, we've diagnosed that when found the stuff. We didn't have any kind of failure. We just had a misrig. What we've done is verify for this vehicle that is not the case. So our confidence in that case is high. An, another part of your question was what about what's tough about reentry. Obviously, we had something unexpected happen for orbital insertion, so we've brought in some independent teams and and NASA has done the same and said, okay, not just what exactly happened with their timer. Is there anything like that where you're retrieving data and anything else that could affect us on entry? And so over the last 24 hours, we've had, we have had teams working that very hard. And right now, we, we think we're ready to go. And, and I'll, ask, I'll comment a little bit to Jim's uh, response. Is, uh, on the parachute uh, rigging issue on paddleboard, we did have a NASA team uh, go through and independently look at all of the closeout photos for this particular spacecraft that's on orbit today. And we went and meticulously looked through those photos and could clearly see that the parachutes on this spacecraft were rigged correctly, and we don't have any concerns about that issue. And we went and looked also at other areas in the parachute system where the rigging was also a little bit difficult. We looked at those closeout photos and uh, ensured that we had a good configuration for the orbit and entry. Um, in terms of the particular trajectory, we're going to fly into White Sands on what's called um, an ascending approach, and that trajectory comes up over the, the Baja Peninsula, um, up just uh, over Mexico, just uh, west of the El Paso area, and then up into the White Sands Space Harbor. Yeah. Uh, the deorbit burn will be uh, about 150 meters per second or so. It takes about 50 seconds. Uh, and then the entry is much like um, any other entry where, you know, at, at entry interface we'll be going about uh, 25 times the speed of sound. Uh, and then, you know, 
uh, by the time we get down into the 30,000 foot altitude range where we deploy parachutes, the vehicle will be going uh, less than the speed of sound, uh, less than Mach 1. Um, you know, and, and I don't have exact temperatures for you, uh, but but it's this kind of the standard kind of entry okay. profile. We gotta get back to them. Yeah. From uh, this is Jim again. From a D orbit timeline between four and five in the morning, we'll run some tests on those crew module thrusters. I talked about it'll be six um, in central U.S. Central Time, 6:23 when we we do a D orbit burn, and we think we're going to touch down somewhere just ahead of. 7 a.m. with sunrise at about 7:05, so that that that's the timeline. The entry, uh, Steve described it well. Coming in, out over a lot of Pacific Ocean, that, that lets us have a little a little timeline flexibility on the service module deorbit burn to make sure it comes down. So we've kind of set this up for a first flight to give us as much as much ability to learn and react as possible. Thank you. Our next question comes from Emery Kelly with Florida Today. Emery, your line is open. Folks, thanks for <clears throat> thanks for doing this. I know it's right before the holidays, so so I appreciate that. Um, I, I guess more my question is, is is a little less technical and more of a historical one. I, I'm just trying to gain some some understanding. You know, I know this is new technology. I know these are new vehicles, um, but at the same time. Uh, you know, it, it was more than 50 years ago that that Gemini was was able to accomplish a lot of these things. I'm just wondering some of your, uh, you know, professional uh, look back on that and and what you see as some of the differences: funding, technology, safety, uh, and maybe that's that's one for Administrator Bridenstine. Uh Yeah, so I would say. Um, Certainly, there's there's a lot of history here, and a lot of successes, and a lot of tests that were unsuccessful, where we had to learn and make modifications. You know, the biggest challenge with this particular test is that um, it's it's all automated, and um, you know the um, some of the automation is is, is what failed. Uh, and when I say failed, we're just talking about it had the wrong timing. You know, as a as a Navy pilot <clears throat> by trade, I can tell you before I take off an aircraft carrier. We have to get the aircraft aligned with the ship, and that requires navigation and timing. And, and um, otherwise, otherwise your airplane is is dumb. <laughs> um, but uh, but we have to we have to get it we have to get it aligned, and you have to have a, a timing signal to do that. In this case, the timing signal was was incorrect. Um, I do believe, and I think this is important, Emery, which is um, had we had a an astronaut on board the spacecraft, an astronaut could have provided mission control with a lot of options that very well could have put us in a position to go to the International Space Station. Um, I can't say that definitively because um, because you, you, you know it didn't it, it didn't it didn't happen that way. So, um, but certainly um, you know I think I think the challenge here was just a, it was a timing signal, and the good thing is we 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 fairly early in this process, understand it, um, and we can get it fixed. And so I think that's very positive. And, and, and Jim, I'll add a couple of things. This is Steve Stitch. Um, you know, with these new vehicles, um, there's a couple of things that we're doing differently than we did in, in, in Gemini. First of all, uh, Boeing has chosen to land on land with a capsule. That's, that's the first time that we've done that with a U.S. spacecraft. It has a landing airbag system that's, that's new and that we're testing on this flight. And then uh, the technology is a little different than for Gemini in terms of how the computers talk to each other and maybe may even more complicated. Uh, the spacecraft are certainly more capable of doing more things, but a little bit more complicated. And then I would also say um, these flights, if I look across U.S. industry and how we're putting these spacecraft and launch vehicles together, it's almost reinvigorating industry uh, in terms of we flew the space shuttle for 30 plus years and that was an operational program, but now we have this development program. And what I see from my perspective, I see us learning once again with a new generation of engineers how to design, develop, and put together these human space vehicles, which will help us not only for these uh, space station missions, but also as we embark upon our journey uh, back to the lunar surface. Um, and again, with parachutes, we flew the wing shuttle for 30 years, and we're almost relearning now uh, how to do these large-scale ring sail human parachutes again, 
Uh, we, there was a generation that learned that for Apollo and Gemini, and now we're on a different generation today. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Jackie Waddles with CNN. Jackie, your line is open. Folks, thanks so much for doing this. Um, so I had a, a couple of questions. I wanted to follow up on uh, the communication link issues with TDRS. Um, I know, Jim, you, you said that there was um, an attitude issue that, that caused that communication gap. I, I wanted to know if you could explain that a little bit more and if there's been you know, any more black zones that you've encountered. Um, and then I also wanted to follow up on exactly what happened in terms of diagnosing the onboard clock. Um, you, know, you mentioned the communicating with the rocket problem. Do we know yet exactly how easy that will be to fix? And have you ruled out a more systemic problem with the software? Thanks, guys. OK, so the first, first part of this is Jim Chilton. The first part of that question was uh, say a little more about the attitude and the comm link. We, of course, we expect this system to have calm at all times. With Tedris, contributing factors is we got off the Atlas V, not where we expected to be, and the spacecraft didn't. You know, this is a point in the mission where we tell the spacecraft where it is, not where it opens its eyes and looks, which is most of the rest of the mission. And so it was not where it expected to be, and it was further from Tedris than it thought. It was also starting to move between satellites, which is a zone where it can take a little more time to get a link, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a link. From an attitude perspective, there's a series of antennas around the vehicle, and because the vehicle wasn't where we expected it to be and it was not where it thought it was, it wasn't pointing the antennas quite right at Tedris. So you, you add those factors together and it took a little more time to connect than we expected. Is that, is that uh, if there's? Yeah, that's, I also uh, want to just follow up about, um, you know, the onboard timing system and if there was any indication yet that there was more systemic problem with the software and, and how diagnosing that issue is going. Oh, okay. So for first time, I'll say with containment, it was as simple as just sending a signal to the spacecraft saying, hey, hey it's this time, not that time. So that was corrected immediately. Uh, from a so far standpoint, and again, I, this, it's early, but I just want to say it doesn't look like anything more than a data retrieval issue where we went and retrieved data that we thought was one place, it was actually another. Uh, and that, so it's, it seems like a pretty narrow thing, although, you know, full disclosure, we're trying to say, no, let's not assume it's narrow. But, and that, let's not assume it's only that kind of issue. Where else, you know, could our test not have perceived something like this? And we're ringing that out pretty hard. But so far, it doesn't look like a major systemic issue. Great. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from David Curley. David, your line is open. Thanks, gentlemen, on uh, Saturday. Uh, several questions. I think what you just said, Mr. Chilpin, is that uh, the timing error caused the communication problem as well, since the craft didn't know it was in the right position. Could you just confirm that for me? And then two other questions. One. Uh, I know General Dynamics uh, made your computers for you. Who wrote the software? Is that Boeing software? And number two, Mr. Stitch, is, is was there ever any, any thought of uh, you didn't have enough fuel to dock, but maybe flying to the station? And could you have done a capture? Thank you. I, I think your characterization that the timer and the results of where the spacecraft was, both from position and attitude, is fair. I probably wouldn't have seen any issue if the spacecraft had, if we'd operated as expected. The software answer is, yeah, that's Boeing code. We we authored that software, so that's. And, and relative to the question about, did we have enough fuel to go um, up to the ISS and dock? We did evaluate that very carefully, and we looked at the propellant margins, and um, we just didn't have enough fuel. We used quite a bit of fuel that first day when we were firing the thrusters, as Jim has talked about, and uh, we didn't have enough propellant to go uh, up close to station, even to approach. And so once we, once we looked at that and saw that that was the case, we thought the best thing to do with the rest of the, the flight was to set up for a good landing, make sure that the thrusters and the rest of the spacecraft were performing nominally, take some time to evaluate 
this, this timing um, error that we saw during ASCINT and verify with uh, computer runs that the computers were, are going to be working fine for the deorbit and entry. And, and that's how we decided to proceed with the rest of the mission. We, yeah, I, th I think it's fair to say we have more propellant to stay longer and do more Absolutely. if we chose to, but we just see that the objectives we're getting now are, you know, we're, we're getting really, we got launch, we're going to get entry and learn. We've done all this with the spacecraft to go fly a few days further not not really necessary to get what we want. So, and we and we it's we don't have the prop to go rendezvous. So, we're gonna come on home. Thank you, so David. David, your question um, was spot on. If the if the mission elapsed timing error did absolutely result in a number of follow-on challenges, the spacecraft thought it was in a position that it was not in, and so it was trying to get into the right position, and so. The, the engines were firing, the, the reaction control um, was, was, was trying to put the spacecraft in the right position, and that resulted in, in some of these engines um, exceeding their limitations from both a, a temperature perspective and from a, um, a duty cycle where, you know, the engines are only supposed to run a certain number of times and um, in a certain amount of time, and, 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 that, and those were exceeded. But had the mission elapsed timing uh, been correct, uh, none of that would have happened. But you're also right in that um, if these activities were not going on, uh, making a data link with TDRIS probably would have happened according to plan as well. So the mission elapsed timing challenge is the challenge that um, if that if that didn't happen, um, you know this this very well could have been a very smooth mission. Thanks, all. We are wanting to remind um, the participants that the questions should be limited to one. One question per participant, please. Our next question comes from Mike Wall. Mike, your line is open. Thank you, guys. Um, just a quick question about the landing tomorrow. Um, there, yeah, like there is a backup opportunity. Could you just talk a little bit about what what would like make you decide to sort of go for that backup opportunity? What are like what are the factors that that you'll weigh, and sort of when that decision will be made, whether to sort of go for the like the initial one, like like kind of early in the morning. Thanks. Okay. Yes, there are there are backup opportunities from this Jim Chilton. From memory, we have one at White Sands, about eight hours away. So you know there are there are another series of them, but we prefer to go to White Sands. We've deployed teams there. I, I'll, I'll interject here. Uh, you didn't see Chris Ferguson with us yesterday on the Boeing team. He would have been there with us. We kind of divided and conquered. Chris, once we realized we were off nominal, we we have a contingency plan and we start to deploy teams where we might bring the spacecraft down sooner than planned. Chris is kind of the leader of our landing team, so we said, hey, get in your car, go to the airport, and head for White Sands. He did that. Uh, you know, frankly, I don't want to speak too much for NASA. Kathy Luters and my program manager immediately started monitoring the technical details. Uh, Steve, Steve and I kind of got over top of that watching it, and you ended up seeing us at the press conference, but there was no intended insult to anybody. So we, the, way we've, the way we've laid this out is we, we prefer to go to White Sands. We've deployed our crew there. We have a landing at about sunrise and another one at about eight hours. Everything's working fine. Uh, if something comes up and we want to pause and think or delay and, and have another MMT meeting, we'll just pause and take the eight hours later, and we have the people there and we have the time and prop. And, and from my perspective, typically um, you have a backup opportunity just in case something is not quite right either at the landing side or we find something on the spacecraft that we have some concern about or in these uh, runs that we're doing offline to verify uh, these particular deorbit opportunities, uh, if we saw something anomalous in those, then we could delay, and as Jim said, there's a backup opportunity uh, about six orbits later uh, to the White Sands also as well. It's a, instead of uh, coming up across the Baja, it's a descending approach into White Sands, and we would take that opportunity if the NASA and the Boeing teams together would see something that would, would give us pause, we can kind of stop reset and then come in on that backup opportunity. The batteries are going great on the spacecraft. The solar arrays are charging them very well. We have plenty of consumables, so we, we would we could set up for that backup opportunity if we had to. Great, thanks. 
Our next question comes from Bill Harwood. Bill, your line is open. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS. Um, yesterday you all said that the orbit insertion burn didn't happen at all, and then later heard it had happened but didn't go full duration. Can you clarify that for me? Did it fire at all? And Mr. Chilton was talking about uh, during test of the thrusters in the, in the uh, command uh, service module, uh, you ran into some sensor issues, you shut some things down and brought them back up. Can you give me a little more detail on that? Were there problems with any manifolds or anything like that that you had to deal with? Thanks. Sure. So thanks, Bill. As to the first question, we, you know, it's probably a, a matter of how you describe it. We did not do the intended orbital insertion burn. No, you know, no fuzz, full stop. What we did choose to do once we had, well, once we got the link with Teeters and said, okay, here's where you are, here's your new clock, we chose, we had put a lot of duty cycles on the prop system, so we chose to go to this circular orbit incrementally. We did a small series of burns, not one big orbital insertion burn. So that, that may be the difference you're asking about, but it's definitely different than what we intended. But, you know, so we, we haven't talked about that as one orbital insertion burn, and therein may lie the, the difference. Regarding your propulsion system question, we, the duty cycle on the thrusters, they were used a bunch of times, controlling attitude early in the mission, and they were also used frequently. So, you know, we started and stopped them in certain positions on the service module rapidly. So we saw uh, in one case, or more than one case, we saw the pressure transducers on those. We think they got hot, and they, they started uh, reporting errors, and then they'd stop reporting errors, intermittent data, if you will. And in one case, we used the thrusters a bunch, and you take pre we used them enough where pressure goes low, and the system will close the valve and say, hey, we have, by the way, we have a redundant prop system. So the system will say, hey, I don't like that pressure, so I'm just going to turn off that leg of the manifold and stop using those thrusters. Uh, all of that appears to be just the, the sensors. And to prove that, over the last 24 hours, the flight control team has been incrementally turning off the transducers, firing the thrusters, and letting the guidance system say, was there an effect on the spacecraft when I hit fire on that thruster? And so far, they're all working. So we think we heated up some sensors by, you know, stepping on the gas hard. And, and, and yeah, Bill, one of the manifolds did end up, uh, because the thrusters were firing so much, it depleted the propellant in that manifold. And today, the team is going to work to, to recover that manifold by slowly opening a series of valves and repressing that manifold, and we think we can recover uh, four of the RCS thrusters on that manifold. It just, the firings were so much in this one manifold, and they were so hot that it kind of depleted that manifold, and that manifold is down, and so we're going to recover that today. Now, 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 I will say that with the thrusters we have, without the, the ones without any of these issues, we're safe to go enter, descend, and land. We want to hand, we want to learn about our spacecraft. We want to hand the flight control team all we can, so good for them to go learn how to gas one back up to refill a manifold, and we, we think all the thrusters will be on coming home, but even if we didn't turn them on, we have enough to come home. Our next question comes from Eric Berger. Eric, your line is open. Hi, and uh, happy holidays <laughs> to everyone there. Um, a question from Mr. Chilton. Um, I know Boeing you know, denied the recent IG report uh, that raised questions about the company's commitment to commercial crew. And I guess I just wanted to ask, you know, if NASA needs a second uncrewed test flight and, and Boeing has to pay for it, are you going to reconsider your participation in the program or are you, you know, here through the sort of, here through the through it all? Hey, happy holidays to you too, Eric. That was nice. Thanks. And no, we're we're in. Simple as that. And from a NASA perspective, I have never seen anything other than Boeing is full in on this program. Uh, the commitment they've made to run the tests required, to do the engineering required, to have the flight control team in place, uh, to execute these flights. Uh, the management team has been outstanding, very transparent in um, issues that they encounter as they get the vehicles ready, and the same has transpired during this mission. I think we've been working very well side by side, and uh, we look forward to continue to do that with all the missions that Boeing's going to fly for us. Okay. Well, good luck with the landing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Faust with Space News. Jeff, your line is open. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to ask either Jim Chilton or Steve Stitch. Um, 
what sort of mission objectives you know at this point you will not be able to achieve, like ISS docking uh, because of this mission, and related, are there mission objectives you're going to try and achieve in alternative ways given this, this different mission? Thanks. So thanks, Jeff. Jim Chilton here. From the, the first question, it's generally around the proximity operations of the space station. You know, we're not, we're not, you know, you already know we're not going to rendezvous and dock. We're not going to fly around the station. We're not going to do some of the things we're going to do is look at the station from different angles and give our, our algorithms in the software a chance to understand what, you know, match what the sensors see with how the algorithms process it. We've been looking at some things. You know, we took, we've taken a look at the space station. You know, we've, so we're getting some of that. And, and we're, we're look at the, relevant to the second part of your question. We're looking around at things that really weren't in the baseline when we thought we were going to rendezvous and dock. Uh, and so we're getting some data, but not the, not the complete set. And, and I would say, you know, the, the, the mission objective that we're not going to achieve is the rendezvous and the docking, and, and as Jim said, checking out those rendezvous sensors. Uh, but I would say the joint Boeing and NASA team has done a good job at looking at things that we can do uh, to go ahead and buy back some mission objectives. Like just today before Jim and I came to this to this event, uh, we did extend the docking system and check that out and make sure that system which is needed for docking uh, will work just as expected. Uh, we've done a couple of uh, tests. We did a, a test of the um, uh, abort system. So the when you're flying in close to station, uh, there are certain conditions if they're not met, the vehicle would autonomously either stop and hold its position or um, execute a maneuver to uh, move away from the space station. We did execute that. Uh, that was yesterday. We executed a test to make sure that system worked. So we're trying to uh, take those things that we would uh, normally do and fold those into this mission uh, and get as many things and learn as much as we can about the spacecraft. The real point of the OFT mission is to learn about the spacecraft and its operations as soon as we can to set us up for those future crewed flights. And I think the team has done a really good job of trying to look ahead. Um, one thing that we're going to get a tremendous data on uh, for the uh, entry and landing, um, Rosie, the anthropometric um, test dummy, has um, accelerometers um, on her, and she has various force measurements on her. And so we're going to be able to measure uh, how the human uh, would receive the the G's during entry and also um, as the parachutes uh, deploy and as we land, we can measure that environment uh, on Rosie and then extrapolate how um, a human would do in that environment. So that's another important objective that is still in front of us. Thanks. Our next question comes from Irene Klotz. Irene, your line is open. Thanks very much. I'm, I hope this doesn't repeat anything. I was disconnected for a couple minutes there. Um, I think this is probably for uh, Jim Chilton, but possibly for Steve Stitch as well. Can you describe what sort of integrated testing took place um, before launch and why this, um, this data pickup wasn't found before? And also, where in the countdown or during ascent was the, um, did the error, do you think the error occurred? Well, you know, as, as to the first question, if I knew, it wouldn't have happened. We're, we're surprised. We did extensive testing, all the software runs in a system integration lab. We, we actually did testing once we had a real Starliner on the Atlas V. So I'll, I'll just say I don't know. We, we, are, we are surprised that our inter, the, a very large body of integrated tests approved by NASA didn't surface this. So we have something to learn there, you know, just, just, just be as clear about that as possible, uh, we, this, unlike perhaps some satellite launches, uncrewed satellite launches where the mission elapsed timer could start when the rocket releases it, because we have abort profiles and things like that, the, the spacecraft's reaching in before we even leave the ground to try to start the timer so that we're, we're counting whatever the spacecraft may have to do, even on the pad or during ascent. So, it, so it's in that time frame pre-launch that we're reaching into registers and finding it in, in, in that time is where, we, where our mistake happened. And was there any way to detect this before, uh, before liftoff? Like, were there any points in the countdown where there was a comparison of space, 
aircraft timing and uh, countdown ground control timing? I, I don't know at this point. I mean, I, 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 we're going to go fix it, so there's going to be a way to detect it. You know, if you're implying that some counter or screen didn't work, we're unaware of that at this time. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of anywhere that that was displayed that anybody could have could have yeah. seen to compare those times, Jim. So, and again, as Jim said, it's pretty early in this investigation. We've we've basically focused for now on okay, understanding the the time error that happened, and trying to ensure that the rest of the mission is protected from any kinds of similar errors. I don't think neither the Boeing or NASA team has, has had time to do a really thorough root cause investigation yet as to when this happened, why it happened, what the corrective actions would be. That's work in front of us uh, to do. We've really been focused on trying to make this mission successful, understanding how the systems are performing in orbit and making sure that the software, the computer parameters are all um, safe to go execute the deorbit burn in the entry. Thanks very much, and good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. We have time for one final question. Our last question will come from Keith Cowley with NASAWatch.com. Keith, your line is open. Yeah, I want to go back to the timer thing for uh, one moment. This is kind of a basic spacecraft 101 thing that we've been doing for half a century. And I'm just wondering why there wasn't a redundancy string or a backup system that would kick in or have the different systems vote with each other to see if the time was correct. And moreover, this issue of the crew possibly you know, being in a position, had there been a crew to do something, how would they have known the timing if the, the timing was wrong? I mean, would they have looked at their wristwatches? And uh, another question, um, you know, there's no live video from this mission, and I'm kind of wondering why, because SpaceX and Russia's Soyuz program do it all the time. And, you know, why is Boeing so shy about it in mission? Did we lose him? I'm sorry, if he's still speaking, on? we can't hear him. I think something happened with the system. Um, Everyone from our end, there's no, nothing on on the screen. So, hello. Hi, can you hear us? Can you hear me? I, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, do I have to ask the question again? Um, I, I guess where you left off. I don't know where I left off. Um, uh, very simply, uh, the timing system on the spacecraft, this is a basic technology we've been doing half a century. Why is it there, that there wasn't a redundancy string or a backup system that could detect the error, like, you know, voting with one system or another to check the time? And there has been mentioned that a crew, had there been one on the spacecraft, could have noticed this. And how would they have known the proper mission time if uh, it was wrong? I mean, would they have had to look at their wristwatches? And secondly, um, why is there no live video from this mission? Uh, uh, Soyuz and uh, SpaceX do it all the time. Uh, why is Boeing so shy about providing live video? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start, and then I'll turn it over to Steve if he wants to go deep on the we, – we haven't, we haven't delved into this deep enough to answer the redundancy question, Keith, so I just don't know. I, I, obviously, that's a great idea, and thanks, and we'll go, we'll go see why what we had in there – didn't didn't perform as expected on the crew. We, they wouldn't have been look. They wouldn't have been timer activated. They would have been on a mission profile and said, "Hey, I didn't. I didn't." They would have known based on spacecraft instruments. I didn't leave where I wanted to be. And they would. And we would have had voice to ground and said, "Go do an orbital insertion burn." And they would have done that manually. The spacecraft lets the crew take over at any time. So we wouldn't have been as dependent on those comm links. From a Boeing video standpoint, the choice we made on uh, this flight test was just to record it. And, and had once we were docked with the station, all that could have come down through the station. We just we just chose to record it and then release it once we land. We thought we'd be sending it down from the station at about the time we opened the hatch, but since we didn't rendezvous, unfortunately, we we don't have it. So that it wasn't a we're not transparent. It was just we just architected the avionics not to on this very first flight test not to not to send it in real time. And, Steve? and I'll add a little bit more to the crew. I mean, what, what the crew would have done uh, when the spacecraft separated from the launch vehicle, they would have noticed extreme amount of jet firing. They would have noticed that the guidance mode was in the wrong mode for where they should have been. They could have went um, free drift and stopped those thruster firings and just kind of flown the spacecraft manually. Uh, this spacecraft has a manual capability that bypasses the flight computers, which is 
uh, a very elegant design. They could have gone to that manual mode. And then the crew is also trained to know that I need to execute a maneuver at about 31 minutes to, uh, to get the vehicle into orbit. And so they could have gone to a manual um, mode of the software and executed a, a manual mode and executed a burn at approximately 31 minutes to just get the, get the vehicle into orbit safely. And at that point, then, you know, work to recover comm. They also can, there's a manual capability with the comm system to where if uh, there's something going uh, off nominal with pointing to Tedris, the crew can actually command various antennas and decide to get a comm link. And so uh, having been in the ops world in the past, I think those, the crew would have methodically worked through those steps, recovered comm, talked about executing a burn if they got comm back to the ground, and then executed that, that burn and got us in a safe orbit, and then we can recover uh, the rest of the mission. Hey, well, um, we'll ask um, one more question from Joey Reuters. Joey from Reuters, is he still on? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Joey? Joey? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Awesome. So sorry. Um, so for Jim Chilton, can you kind of summarize real quick what will be different about this upcoming landing opportunity and the opportunity originally planned a week from now? Um, at what max temperatures will Starliner enter uh, upon reentry? And for Jim and uh, Steve Stitch, I was wondering what the root cause investigation will look like after this. Is it a formal anomaly investigation? Um, and will it involve simulations of the software? Uh, thanks so much. Okay, this is Jim Chilton. Regarding the landing, the um, we're going to go execute basically the landing we planned, an ascending node coming out of the southwest towards over El Paso and down to Las Cruces. Another reason we like what we've chosen, it's basically what was planned and trained for. As far as the software anomaly goes, I, I don't, I, I'll defer on labeling, but what we have done is said, let me get some independent people run, you know, running through. This is something happened that we don't like, and so our protocol is to go take an independent team and start looking through that. What that gets labeled or named, I don't know, but that's what's going to happen. Yeah, in terms of the landing, the, the temperatures and the entry profile itself will be the same as we were going to execute for the nominal. Uh, the orbit's just a little bit lower, but once you get into the entry profile into the atmosphere, it's, it's about the same. And uh, certainly, Jim, I know you'll include NASA on the investigation. will be part of it. We'll take just like help. any anomaly that we, we have, we'll build a, a kind of a fault tree and start working through what happened. And then you ask the next question, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Try to understand sure. the root cause of the problem. Yeah. I'm very confident in the way we've participated in several of those with Boeing. So, um, yeah, there, just, uh, just to leave no doubt, your flight crews are going to be on this, and you're entirely welcome to look at every bit of it. Yep, yep. appreciate that. Okay, well, thanks, everyone, for joining on this call. Um, we're going to close it with, uh, with the Administrator Bridenstine with some closing remarks and then some, uh, some housekeeping items from our end. Mr. Bridenstine? Well, I just thank everybody for continuing to follow this test flight. Um, I, I want to emphasize that um, we have had a lot of successes. We've gotten a lot of test objectives complete. I would also emphasize that um, tomorrow is a really big day. Uh, tomorrow is, you know, pe people, people want to know what percentage of the test objectives have been complete. I hear that a lot. But not every test objective is weighted equally. I think Jim Chilton mentioned that earlier. They're not all the same. Launch, of course, is a big one, and entry, descent, and landing is another really big one. So tomorrow is a big day. Um, we have to be on our A game. Certainly, there's going to be a lot of data that needs to be reviewed when this is over. Um, but from the Boeing and NASA perspective, um, I want us to focus like a laser. <laughs> on this entry, descent, and landing for tomorrow. And um, I appreciate everybody for being on this phone call.
Thank you, everyone, for participating. You can listen to the replay of this teleconference by dialing 1-800-568-6411. As a reminder, NASA and Boeing will have live coverage of landing starting at 6.45 a.m. Eastern on NASA TV and the agency's website. Following the landing coverage, NASA will host a media conference with Boeing. More information about the media conference will be provided on nasa.gov later today. Thank you, and we'll talk soon.